Yo, this is Ross. I'm uh, really excited today, guys. This is uh, really the beginning of persimmon season. I want to convince you guys in this video of why you should be growing persimmons. We have two different persimmons here. They're the same variety, but one is one is fresh and one is dry. It's kind of why it looks so strange. Um, this is, on all honesty, my second favorite fruit and also my second favorite dried fruit. I really like them dried second to dates. I think uh, a really perfectly moist majule date is very hard to beat. But persimmons, they dry incredibly well and they taste so good. You can have them almost all winter if you dry them. But they're also my favorite fall fruit because I would consider figs not really a fall fruit, at least for me, because a lot of my figs uh, are ripening. They've been ripening. In fact, they're done. Uh, it's early October here, and they're pretty much over. Whereas the persimmons now, I would consider this the beginning of our fall weather. The persimmons are just now starting. And I know a lot of you guys out there who watch my videos love persimmons. Um, I want to show you guys a lot of the trees. I want to show you guys a little bit of an update because we, we kind of neglect the persimmon. Uh, there's not really a whole lot that goes on, a lot of technique that goes on. I want to talk about some of the trees and kind of what we've been doing and some of the techniques I'm going to be using, particularly pruning techniques. we will show you guys a, a pruning video sometime down the road in the winter. However, I also want to show you guys the fruits and talk about the fruits and different types. And I think the best piece of information, the most important information about persimmons is that there's two different types. You can break them up into American persimmons, which is native to the Americas, and also the Asian persimmon. Um, and all persimmons are actually related to another subgroup of tropical fruits, believe it or not, like the black pudding fruit or the black sapote. And they're related to another fruit that I'm kind of blanking on the name of, uh, but they, oh, they're also related, I think, to pears in some way along the line. And they kind of have a pear flavor to them. This, what you're looking at here, is my American persimmon tree. So this is one that's native here. It's called uh, Proc. And it seems to be a good producer. We even have it in an area here this year with poor soil. I find that this is a great way to grow persimmons and a lot of fruit. You don't necessarily want them in great soil. This is you know, we've even got some weeds down in here. We have some roots that are showing. It's mostly clay, heavy soil. Um, when you feed your persimmons too much and you give them fertilizer or you build up the soil too much, I find, they just love to grow and grow and uh, that's all they'll do. They won't really fruit. And even this guy, this is its first year, technically, in the ground, even though this tree is probably three or four years old. It's now putting out about, let's say, I don't know, 12 to 15 fruits. I've already harvested somewhere around five of them off of here. And something I'm noticing with this particular variety is that the, the fruits are falling off. There's a calyx here, I believe this is what it's called, at the top of the fruit where this attaches to the, to the branch. And this is very difficult to remove. It's very difficult to remove this black piece here but the fruit will fall off from the calyx because it's so soft and that's one thing the persimmon has to do. At least there's a subgroup of persimmons, right? So we have the Americans, we have Asian persimmons, we'll show you guys in a minute, but there's a subgroup of astringent persimmons and non-astringent persimmons and the astringent persimmons are so astringent like the American persimmons, that's mostly what the Americans are. Uh, they're trying to breed Asian persimmons and American persimmons together to hopefully lose that astringency. However, they're so astringent, like a green banana, right? You know when you take a bite of a green banana and uh, it gives you a dry mouth feel? Multiply that by maybe four and coat that whole feeling in your mouth. And um, that's what you get when you eat a persimmon at the wrong time. And that's why Persimmons have such a bad rap, and that's why we don't really appreciate them that much in the United States. They're my second favorite fruit behind figs when, f when grown fresh. 
And to be honest with you, they should be in every grocery store across America. They should be as popular as bananas. They're better than bananas. And uh, I don't really get it. The only explanation I can come up with why people don't really appreciate them here, because they're, they're widely grown in Middle East. They're widely grown in Europe. I go to, I'm in the supermarkets and, and um, markets down in, in Israel. They're all over the place. They're all over Europe. Why is it that they're not really that popular here in the U.S.? We just are not educated. And that's where I come in. So you guys tell your friends about this video, about this amazing fruit that we're just missing out on. Um, it just is not, when you eat it at the wrong time, it is very astringent. And the, the consumer doesn't know about that. They don't know about their food. It's a shame here in the United States. Food education is very limited. No one really knows where their food comes from. And this one in particular is horrible if you eat it at the wrong time. So unless you guys are really educated and know to eat these persimmons, not when they're green and not even when they're orange, but when they're bright orange and they're soft, they have to be softer than a tomato. Uh, the one that I'm going to show you guys over there on the table is only as soft as a tomato. But they should be softer than a tomato. Okay? And if you do that, you wait long enough, and that's kind of the other issue with them. Is that you're not really going to find a, a, a fruit at the store that's softer than a tomato. It's not going to sell. But there is non-astringent persimmons, which you can eat like a crisp apple. And they're hard on the inside and outside. And uh, those for sure should be grown in the store and you won't have any of that astringency and you won't need any education. Um, here you guys are looking at a different variety that I'm growing. It's called Guang Yang. I had this, this is a pretty young tree. They get established though very quickly. I find after three years, they'll be giant trees. We'll show you guys my really large tree. In a minute, here's some seedlings. These are young trees that we tried grafting onto that didn't succeed. And we're planting these seedlings here to graft onto them, a variety called Sejo. And here's actually a young seedling that I did success successfully graft Sejo onto. And I have them wrapped with this tree tube because uh, we have some voles that are kind of coming in around my pear trees over here. What's nice about the persimmon though, compared to the pear, is that they almost have no issues. The pear has many fire blight issues. I think the persimmon can get fire blight, but it's very difficult. Um, also, the fruits are almost unblemished. Nothing bothers the fruits. No insects bother the trees, the fruits. If you are getting some pests, maybe you can get some borers on your persimmon tree itself. But overall, I mean, the tree is one of the oldest fruits, you know, that exists. It's been grown for a long time, cultivated for a long time. And um, it is just well adapted here. It just grows like a champ. And you can see this big beauty here. This is my now four year old persimmon tree. And we're approaching 20 feet. Um, I need to really be careful with my pruning techniques this year. I want to mention to you guys a couple things. When you have a young persimmon tree, even four years old, they're sort of reluctant to fruit. And you can see around this tree, as beautiful it is and as big as it is, there really isn't that many Rosianca persimmons on here. And it's very common for these trees to drop a lot of their fruit at a young age, especially I find when they grow very vigorously, and I've been adding mulch underneath this tree for three years now. And that mulch has broken down over time, and you can even see some comfrey that's growing under here. This comfrey is due to the fact that I've been putting much, many comfrey <laughs> underneath this tree. And over time, it has fed this tree, and it's created wonderful soil here. I have incredible topsoil in this location. And I think that is a detriment, believe it or not. And I think I'm going to have to wait even longer 
for this tree to fruit, heavily, I should say, because it just likes to grow and grow and not fruit. So what my goal is here in the upcoming season, I'm gonna do a couple things. One, I don't feed this and I don't water this. If you do either one of those things, forget about fruit. Um, it's really not a good idea. The second thing, at least in my climate, by the way, guys, with that last statement. The second thing is that when we prune this tree, I did try some summer pruning. You can see some branches here we took out. It has black sap and also has black roots. It's very strange. We took out a number of these branches. You can see one right here we took out. A lot of the upward growing branches we took out. We left a lot of the branches that are growing horizontally or even downwards. And that's gonna, I think, help these things fruit heavier because just naturally, these upward growing shoots on any fruit tree will fruit a lot less than the branches growing horizontally or downwards. So that's one way to increase the density. Is that gonna solve the issue? I'm not sure, but another thing we're gonna do is that last year, we really tried to get the form of this tree perfect and so that it wasn't so lanky. You can see these really long, lanky branches. And what I did was I cut those branches basically in half uh, everywhere, all on the tree. Took out about half the growth on the tree. And I think that's just too hard of a pruning. And rather than, uh, let's take this branch here as an example. Rather than cutting this branch in half about here, I'm gonna take out the whole branch. And I think this is a good solution um, to hard pruning. I'm even gonna do this on the figs. I think this is a better way to prune. Rather than heading back branches, I'm gonna take back an entire branch. Just thin out the branches. Um, so I have, I have a feeling those two things I said are gonna work, especially with in terms of the fruit drop. And we just have to cross our fingers. I've even thought about girdling this tree. I, I half girdled it to see if that would help. Uh, but it's too late in the season now um, at the time that I did it. So this is my Rosianca here, guys. I want to just talk about variety real quick. This is an American and Asian persimmon hybrid. Um, the ones that we looked at, by the way, over there, by the pears, by the greenhouse, those are Asian persimmons. Seijo, Guangyang, I have Miss Kim in the front. I have a I have a, a couple trees, I can't remember the names of them, but I have about three planted or four of them in the front that I won't show you guys just yet. But this guy is a hybrid between the two, and this is a big experiment here. And they're trying to breed more of these by crossing them together. And they, essentially you net yourself the positives of both in that the Asian persimmons, a lot of people like the flavor more. I don't necessarily agree just yet. People love the flavor of the Asian persimmons, but they also really value the hardiness and the adaptability of the American persimmons. They're hardier trees, stronger trees, more vigorous trees, larger trees. So by combining a tree like Rosianca that was almost 20 feet tall, my Asian persimmons that we can show you guys over here, those are only gonna get 10 foot by 10 foot. They're, they're gonna cap out at a certain size, maybe 12, 14 feet. But if you have, you know, an American like we have back in the corner over here, they're gonna get as tall as they can get. They would get 40 feet if I let them. So you kind of combine the both and get certain traits of both and it really just does change the, the perspective on growing the fruit. Even the hardiness, because the Asian persimmons are not very hardy. A lot of the Asian persimmons, uh, you need to be in at least zone 7A, maybe even zone 7B with the majority of them. There are some Asian persimmons here that I'm growing, like Seijo, Guang Yang, Miss Kim, Tam Cam. Those will survive zone 7A, but if you're in zone 6, you're kind of pushing it. And you're almost forced to grow either an American persimmon, which is what we're looking at here, or a hybrid that has inherited that hardiness. 
So I'm gonna put you guys down now. We're gonna show you guys the fruit. I hope everybody's been enjoying this talk so far. It's really a wonderful fruit. And uh, it took me a while to unfortunately get you to this point, but you know, it is what it is. So let's try the, uh, the fresh form here first. It's very gooey. It's very soft and it should be gooey. Softer than a tomato. You don't have to even chew it. It's got a great persimmon flavor, which you could describe as a uh, figgy <laughs> or date-like or raisin-like. It has a dried fruit flavor, which is uh, the base persimmon flavor combined with maybe some pear. Let me come this way. Maybe I can get out of the sun. That's not happening. You know, it's more like a pear. And uh, it has spices in it. There's weird spice flavors in here. Some people have said rum raisin. Um, I've heard other people describe these as, uh, well, I would say they're definitely like a gooey, sugary, sweet pear. Um, maybe that's a good description, but it's also incredible in that some of these taste like marshmallows. The sugar content increases so much that they actually taste a lot like marshmallow. You could say a lot of them taste like caramel, brown sugar. It's just an incredibly sweet, awesome fruit. The ones that are not astringent, that don't have to be gooey, are more like a pear. And they're more crisp like a pear, uh, but very different texture. Um, it's very difficult to exp explain. They have very few seeds. In fact, this variety seems to have one seed per persimmon if you pollinate them, which you don't need to for the majority of persimmons that are, are available. They won't have any seeds um, and you won't have to pollinate them. Additionally, around this time of the year, uh, we're gonna have a frost that's gonna come in in about a month. And you're gonna have persimmons left on your tree. And if you have persimmons left on your tree uh, and the frost comes in and that, what that's going to do is it's not going to hurt the fruit, but it is going to send a signal to the fruit to really speed up that ripening process. And a lot of them will turn from astringent to not astringent very soon, and they'll go from hard to soft very quickly. So it's very important that if you don't want that to happen and you want them to ripen more naturally, a slower process because you want to preserve them and have them over a longer period, Take them away from the frost. There's people who believe that the frost, by speeding up that ripening process, you're robbing the fruits of some of that sugar content, some of that flavor. Um, so for me, it's really just up to preference. Now here's a dried persimmon. And this is extremely, extremely good. What I really like to do, this one I just kind of, you know, opened it up with my hands like this and then just stuck it in the dehydrator. But what I really like to do is slice them this way into very thin strips, kind of like uh, potato chips. And they come out incredible, guys. It's like a, a really awesome fruit leather. It's just got the best flavor to it. They have the best texture when dried. It's kind of like eating a potato vodka. It's like eating a potato at this point. However, they're so much better, I think, when you slice them um, into potato chips. They're very sweet. It's my second favorite dried fruit. Um, so that is like persimmons in a nutshell, guys. If I had land, 
I would have a persimmon orchard and I would sell persimmons. I try to promote this fruit because it is just, it's just such a wonderful, misunderstood, underrated piece of fruit that I just don't understand why some people don't go crazy for this. You can't find them in the store and if you do, they're nowhere near as good as the quality you can get in, at home. I'm telling you. Um, this is one of those fruits you're going to just have to grow yourself. So get yourself a persimmon tree. In four years, you're going to have more persimmons that you know what to do with. So try not to go too crazy with the persimmon trees. You know, I think one's enough. But if you have intentions of eating these all winter and you're going to dry them like I suggested or even do big things with them, there's tons of uses for these, by the way. Then I would start saying, all right, well, you could have more than one tree because you're just not going to know what to do with these things. It's like, you know, I had 300 peaches this year off one tree. What does one human being do with that? You know? Anyway, guys, that's persimmons. Um, really, I'm a big, huge fan of this. They're just so good. All right, everyone, if you enjoyed this, please share it with your friends that you might think would like persimmons or like to know about persimmons. Um, share this with other persimmon growers that might be interested. And uh, we'll catch you all soon, all right? Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Check our website out, figboss.com. That's our blog. And we'll see you all soon, all right? I'm going to do a persimmon pruning video come the wintertime. So stay tuned for that. Ross out.